On the next episode of Painting and Travel, Sarah boards the Icebreaker Mackinac on Lake Huron and tours the ship's engine room. Back in his studio, Roger uses oils to create a painting of the retired Coast Guard ship. Michigan, we traveled up the eastern coastline along Lake Huron, arriving in the village of Mackinac City, last stop before you cross the Mackinac Bridge going to the Upper Peninsula. This is the retired icebreaker used by the U.S. Coast Guard and the subject of Roger's next painting. Later we'll tour the inside and find out how it performed, breaking through the frozen waterways to create safe passage. I'll be using oil paints today on this 24 by 30 inch linen canvas. I've primed this uh, canvas with a few different muted colors, similar to the colors I'll be using on the finished painting, along with this dull sky, this wood here, and this grassy area. On my palette, I have titanium white, ultramarine blue, cerulean blue, alizarin crimson, Indian yellow, cadmium yellow. These are earth colors here, burnt umber, raw sienna, burnt sienna, yellow ochre. Then I have a few greens here, sap green, chromium oxide green, and a uh, yellow green. This is an interesting ship, and I like the composition here. This is an old structure here that used to be used with railroads to bring railroad cars onto a ship. And this is sort of a drawbridge sort of a thing. And uh, it just made this nice pattern here, this nice strong pattern with this strong horizontal and these verticals. So that's sort of what attracted me to this particular view. I think I'll start by using my darks. Ultramarine blue and uh, burnt umber <laughs> always makes a sort of a good neutral dark color. And I'll begin just by putting in this uh, structure here. Now earlier on I did uh, pencil this in which gave me a sort of a head start on this. It's always hard to know where to start on a painting, you know, it's just uh, gotta start somewhere. So I usually begin with my darks, work towards my lights, but that's not always the case. These were very heavy beams here. Now I'll mix up my colors some. I'll take some of this alizarin crimson, ultramarine blue, make sort of a purple color, but these are all so dark at this point, it really doesn't matter. It's, it's almost black, but not quite. You would see a difference if I were to use black. It, it would just not have quite the, uh, the look. I won't put any white on my brush right now. That will come real soon, but I just want to stay with my darks at this first stage without using any white. These are big counterweights here as this drawbridge goes up. These two big uh, barrels, I think they're full of concrete or something, they act as a counterbalance. Makes a nice design. This particular pier is not used at all anymore. It's long since outlived its usefulness. I think this was used long before the uh, Mackinac Bridge came into existence. Now over on this side, we have some greens. I'll just pick up my sap green, a bit of burnt sienna, and this is very dark as well. On the first stage of this painting, uh, it's, it's all about blocking in the big shapes. See how I, I'm going to lose that there? I'll put a little bit more definition in there later on, but right now, this works as one large area, one large shape. Well, those are my very, very darks. Uh, right now I can begin to add a little bit of white to these areas. So I go from dark to light. Some of these areas of grass back here are slightly lighter. I want to vary my colors here. I'll dip into my yellows, 
change these greens somewhat. I still want to keep these fairly dark. I try not to fuss at all about this brushwork yet. I just try and keep it loose. Gosh, one color I didn't put out was the uh, Kenyam Red, and I should do that. I put out the uh, Lizard and Crimson. You put out some cadmium red there. And my burnt sienna. That is not a very bright uh, look on the hull of this ship. And on this side over here, it's catching more sunlight. Cerulean blue and a bit of brown make a nice gray. And here's this white stripe on the side of the ship. And of course, since it's not getting hit by bright sunlight, it's not a pure white. It's sort of a grayish color. That's the thing about being an artist. You ask anybody what color this stripe is, and they'll say that's a white stripe. But as an artist, you have to look at it, and as you look at it, you say, well, it, the local color might be white, but if I paint it, you know, it's in shadow, or maybe it's in sunlight, so that really changes the real color of it. I'm losing some of my drawing again. I've got a lot of portholes and things up in that area. I'll just, just lose those for now. But as long as I have this particular color out, I might as well wander over to the road here, to the far left, and put that in. It's about the same color as the uh, ship there. I think I'll put a little yellow ochre in that, though, and make it slightly warmer. Right over here, we have a, a barrier with some uh, a lot of large rocks. And that goes way back here. I'm picking up a slightly larger brush now, and I'll put the sky in here. And it was a very gray, windy day, so I don't want that sky to have a lot of color. So it's going to be very gray as well. Just a touch of cerulean blue and a touch of brown. Let's see, you know, that's that's about the right value now, but I think it needs to be a little bit lighter, a little bit more cheery, so add this slightly lighter value here and slightly brighter color of the sky. Now when I apply something like the sky, I don't want to spend a lot of time just dabbing the sky, you know, like this, to put it on. It would just take too long, and it really serves no purpose. Just grab a lot of paint there, as much paint as this brush will hold, and I just lather it on and get it over with. There's no point for me to just dab away at it endlessly. This is a large, flat area, so I'll just Paint it like a large flat area. I could even use a larger brush, but this one, this one will do. And we've got the mast right in here, but I'm going to lose that on my drawing. Just have to find that, put it in later. Much easier than trying to paint around it. All right, the only thing we haven't addressed right now is this pier or what remains of it. So I'll mix a darker color, and I'll just very loosely create a few of the patterns that I can see in here. There's a lot of boards running uh, this way, and there's some running this way, and that uh, the boards that are running this way seem to give me a darker look. So that's what I'm uh, going for right now. Really, this color underneath here really helps a lot because as I scumble these colors over that, some of this brown is going to show through here. If this were just white, uh, this would have a different look and it would not be quite as easy to, to paint this if I didn't have this underpainting on here. It's just a little bit of a tone, but it, it, it helps, helps a lot. Well, that gives me all my large basic shapes all blocked in now. So that's really the first step to any painting that I do. Get everything covered, just block it in. Now I can start working on refining these areas and putting in more detail.
But without that first step, that first stage, uh, I would have a lot more difficulty in completing a painting had I not blocked in everything. I'm trying my best to put down these strokes and not go over them and over them and over them. I'm just trying to put down a stroke and leave it alone. And that's especially important with oil paints. If I were to go over this and over this, it would blend with this green color underneath. But if I just lay it down, put it down with one stroke and kind of leave it alone, uh, I'll be better off. Now I'll make a few strokes and place these boards in here, these timbers. And I'll just build this up a little bit at a time. Just trying to put these strokes down and leave them alone without too much blending. I load my brush up and then put it down there and try and get that done in one stroke. Now I'll continue uh, by putting these lighter areas over my darker areas. And here we have this uh, seawall here and a lot of heavy timbers along that as well. One thing that will make this uh, painterly looking is not trying to work on every single little detail. Just to, to suggest things is uh, kind of important for me when I can do it. can't always do it, but I want to eliminate a lot of the finer details, especially till last. Don't want to work on any of those right now. Now I blocked in all these big beams here. Now it's time to refine those as well. Some are slightly lighter. So I'll just go over that, hit that with one stroke. I don't want to work on any one area of the painting for very long before I jump to another area of the painting. So now I'll go back over here to the road. It's a dirt road here. Some of this road is sort of spilling over onto the grass. And although it was an overcast day, I'm going to uh, put a bit of sunlight, just a little bit of dappled light here and there. One nice thing about painting is I don't have to rely totally on my photograph. I'm, you know, free to change it around and improve it if I think I can. Painting like this is all about variations in color and value, but important for me to keep this as one large shape, not to break it up too much, to make too many separate little centers of interest, but just have more little areas within those large shapes. Now I can use a pretty large brush, even to make small lines. For instance, here on this uh, ship here, I'll just use the edge of this brush around here and make a fairly sharp line with it. Since I'm working in oils, I'm going to put this aside for a while and let it dry. That way when I come back to it, some of these areas won't be quite so wet and I can go over them a little easier. It's not every day that you get to board a U.S. Coast Guard cutter, and this one is the Mackinac. It's very special, and we have an opportunity to talk with Bill Boyle, who served on this vessel a number of years ago. Nice and meeting you. Nice meeting you, too. And now he's a volunteer here, and all the questions you have about this amazing engine and the crew and even the food, he can answer. So I'll start off with the engine. They are 10-cylinder opposed piston Fairbanks Morris diesel, 2,000 horsepower. The same thing they use in trains, ships, and submarines. Oh, so it's tremendously powerful then. 2,000 horsepower each. And we have a very special propeller on the Mackinac in the very front of our ship. Because how we're breaking ice with the Mackinac is we're actually riding up on it and crushing it. Because we're shaped like a great big football. To slide up on that ice and we're using the weight of the boat to crush it. But that bow propeller, that's helping us break the ice easier by pulling the water out from underneath it. That's fascinating. I always thought it must have something sharp on the front to sort of no. cut through it. But you're saying you're going up right. and then sort of crashing down. Right. And this creates a fracture line. Absolutely. And then yeah. you go from there and just push right. through. And that bow propeller is actually helping chop the ice up because we cannot leave big chunks of ice behind. Because our job is breaking shipping lanes for the freighters to follow. What really helps us break the ice is our tremendous weight. And we accomplished some of that with what we're built out of. 
This is the hull thickness of the Magna. That's an inch and five eighths thick steel. It's got a little weight to it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. This is about 20 times heavier than I thought it was going to be. And they built this incredible ship in just three short years down the Toledo shipyard during World War II, which meant quite a few of the workers that built this remarkable ship were women. Wanda the Welder. We owe a lot to those women who we certainly do. kept the home fires burning as well as built things while That's the right. men were at war. Yeah. So how many crew did you have in your day? The normal crew of this ship when I was on here was 130. We each had our own bunk, but we were stacked three high. And it took that many because each engine room, and this is one of the engine rooms, each of these engine rooms would usually have a crew of five down here. Uh, Throttleman, he's the one in charge of the engine room and knows how to repair things and how to keep it running. And underneath my, uh, myself, the Throttleman, I had two oilers and two wipers. Well, the oilers, they're learning to become a, a throttleman eventually. Because mm -hmm. you want that job because you don't get your hands dirty. You're the one that gives the orders. I see. And then the wiper's a brand new guy, so he's the one keeping the engines clean, wiping things down, grease and oil that's spilled, you know, spray. Yes, keep it all clean so that there's Keeping no chance of a, fire a sparked or, right. fire. Correct, yeah. Bill, when you get ready to turn the engine on, what does that look like? Okay, they're started by high pressure air. We have to hold the alarm switch down. We give them a shot of air to start them and then run it up to run for running. And when the oil pressure comes up, we let go of that. Otherwise, a very loud horn would be going off until that oil pressure hits. And, and tell you that you did something wrong. Right. How do you keep up your energy when you have to work this hard, this many hours? Do you have a special kitchen? Special chef. They did feed us incredibly well on here. That was my favorite part of the boat was the food. Uh, we did eat good. Yeah. Now, being the engine room, this would stay warm enough to get through those winter months. Absolutely. Of yeah, very warm. That was the most comfortable time on here was the winter because you could control the temperature. Now, in the summer, it was extremely hot. It's so hot that we used to even have to take salt pills. I see, just to keep from passing out from right. losing so because much. Because these big locomotive engines put out a lot of heat. Yeah. Well, it's been really exciting to me to be down here and to see this. Thanks for taking time to tell me about it. And we're going to look around at some of the other rooms and look outside a bit. And I hope to see you again in fair weather. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> all right. All the best. Well, this painting has had time to dry overnight. So I'm going to begin by adding some more detail. And on the side of this ship here, the icebreaker, there's some lettering. It says Coast Guard. So I'm going to use my pastel pencil and I'll sketch this lettering in here. U.S. Coast Guard. And these letters are very close together, so they'll hardly be readable. So I don't need to do too much here as far as sketching these. And while I have my pastel pencil here, I'll just also sketch in the area where these portholes go. And I'll take my ruler, a piece of blue chalk, and I'll put this mast back in here. I couldn't see it with the white chalk. And we have a mast up here, yard arm, some flags down here. So now I think we can continue with the painting. Of course, I'm using a smaller brush for these details. I've cleaned my palette here. So I'll take my ultramarine blue and brown, and we'll begin with the mast. Just drag that right down. And then the yard arm here, across the top. Just indicate a few little things that are attached to this mast. I have no idea what they are. And down here, there's some more areas of radar, lights, who knows what. Just using my ruler here and my thumb to keep these lines nice and straight. This goes very quickly. And next comes the portholes, evenly spaced right along this line I drew in there with my pastel pencil. I'm trying to do this as simple as I can with a stroke or two. All right, now let's get our white. <laughs> really not white again, it's a dark gray because it's in shadow. And we'll add this U.S. Coast Guard lettering. Just suggesting that if I were to paint this lettering really accurately, it probably would not go along with the rest of the looseness of the painting. It would sort of look out of place. So 
really this is just a suggestion of that lettering. And with ultramarine blue, touch of brown, we've got this stripe right here. Well, we have a number of lines up here, ropes and lines. And a couple of them hold some flags. So let's put these lines in here. I just with a very light touch, spring those down. And then we have some lines that are hard lines that do not bend. They're very, very straight. So I'll use my ruler here. And then we have a lot of lines just coming down from this. Just kind of have one chance at this to drag those down. And with a few colors, we'll put in indication of some of these flags here. Some blue ones, red ones. You know, these all have patterns on them, but I'm not going to worry about the patterns very much. They're just too far back to worry about that sort of thing. I'm going to move back down into this area of this ramp here. And I'll mix up my darker colors and I'm just going to accent some of these before it was just a bit too wet in order to go in and add any detail. But now, since this is dry, I can go over this and these colors won't blend and I can get a hard, hard line now, a hard edge, which I couldn't do when all these paints were so wet. It's just a lot of spaces and things between these boards. Now, as things get closer in the foreground, there's always more definition. So anything up here is going to be sharper and harder edged than anything back here. Now there are some variations to that because I don't want everything up here so sharp and so detailed that it'll take my eye and interest away from this area, which is the center of interest. So I don't want to bring too much attention to this area down here. It's not the, it's not the most important area of the painting. This really is up here. So I have to sort of balance this and downplay these hard edges so as to not to keep the eye too involved down here. So I don't want to continue to add so much detail that it will distract from my center of interest. It's hard to know when to really make that break, when to stop putting in detail. It's really putting in detail is, is a lot of, it's, you know, it's sort of fun, it's interesting, but I don't want it to distract from my main theme. There's a lot of weeds and things growing up here between these old timbers. Taking some greens and just with a flip of my brush, adding some of these weeds and foliage and things in here that's growing up over time. We even have some back here, just with a light touch, just flip that up. Just flip that up like that. We even have some up here. I sort of like this right up here. Just had a few little things growing up here. Now, I always talk about keeping the large shapes as one large shape, but within those large shapes, I can refine that with more subtle shapes. So in here, I think I'm going to take a lighter value and change the color just to make some slight variations in all these boards. I'll make a few lighter, a few with different colors. I'm using some green here on these boards. It really just sort of ties all this together. So we don't have such a foreign looking batch of colors here as opposed to the colors here. I'll take some of these colors here and I'll move those colors over to here as well. Now I can do the same thing with the uh, colors of this ship. We'll take some lizard and crimson and cadmium red. Maybe a touch of brown in there or gray. And I'll add some of these warm colors into these boards. And the idea here is just to tie everything together to give this painting some harmony. So no one part of the painting looks out of place. And these are things that I don't really see in my photograph, but I just uh, feel that if I add them to the painting, they'll make a better painting. See, I'm getting some variation in here now. Not too much, but I think probably just about enough at this point. I don't see any spaces between these boards where I can see the water, 
but I'm going to add some anyway, just to give this a little more interest and character, like there's some, like these boards are separated. Ultramarine blue and brown, once again, we'll take some of the colors from these boards, maybe some touch of green, and I'll add some of these colors here over in this area. Just want to tie this all together. I'm really not considering every stroke I put on here. This is more about just feeling what needs to happen and just sort of letting the brush do its own thing here. Then we have a few more of those tracks from cars and trucks. Now right along here, there are some other little details, a little, some fences with a little uh, rope for a barrier, a few little signs describing what the ship is. So this is sort of a big area here. I'm going to break that up by putting in a few of those areas of detail. Again, I'll use my ruler, put in a few of these fence posts. These are sort of wander all over the place. They're not really in a straight line. Okay, now wash that brush out, get a lighter color here. And let's put the rope on this fence. I'm going to take some of this grass and add a bit more grass out into the road. There again, it will help to tie everything together. Well, I think with those few patches of grass there, that's going to finish this painting of the Mackinac Icebreaker. For more information about painting and travel with Roger and Sarah Bansimer, visit paintingandtravel.com.